of wife. Welcome in Jesus' name. God bless you. Tell us what happened and tell us what God is doing. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We honor you, Lord Jesus. I hope you're not disappointed it's not Pastor Robinson preaching, okay? The Holy Spirit is speaking today. God is a good God. Um, one thing that blessed me yesterday at the place where we got to see, he said, God, actually, you came in to see this all, but God used this as a bait to bring you to where he wants you to be. Actually, for me, it was a revival service. I mean, we're just set on fire for Jesus because something he said, he said, God, what God is about to do in our lives, in the church, in the world, because we are drawing close to the end. You know, as we are drawing close to the end, of course, we can see that there is increase of darkness. That is obvious. When they start teaching our children about transgender, that is increase of darkness, right? Darkness is pushing, pushing towards us. But all of a sudden, Light is also pushing at the world. <laughs> the light of God is like, you can't, you can't, you can't deny it. I'm here. The kingdom of God is saying, I am here. And now I'm giving you undeniable evidence of my presence. Undeniable evidence. So I want us to be excited. We are living in the best, the finest of times finest of times whenever i see darkness increasing and our children having to do things that you know i'm like this same children will cast out demons will go to their teacher and say in the name of jesus i will pick that spirit so where, <laughs> wherever you see darkness get excited but you see get excited but you know what get warned at the same time because his mercy comes with judgment. And judgment will start in the house of the Lord. Get warned. Because you see, when darkness and light, when they start pushing at each other, darkness is trying to overcome the light. Of course, the light, the darkness shall never overcome light. Right? But light is pushing. Now, there's a gray zone there. That is neither light nor darkness. What is happening in the last days is that the gray zone is getting smaller and the gray zone is disappearing. You're either for light or you're for darkness. There is no middle ground. What God is doing in the last days and pouring out his spirit, you cannot be in the middle. You'll be kicked out. You will be kicked out. So, tighten your seatbelt and tell yourself every darkness in me got to go. Because I cannot be a gray zone. I cannot host the Holy Spirit and host demonic spirits. I cannot host the love of God and host bitterness. I cannot host the glory of God and host sin. No more gray zone in my life in Jesus' name. Can you say that? I just proclaimed it for myself. No more gray zone. I tell God, walk on my character. Walk on my character because I cannot. I cannot be having marks of the devil in me and saying that I am a minister of the gospel. And he said something. He said, because of the glory that is coming on the church, because of the blessing, God has to walk on us. He has to walk on our character. Because if your gift takes you where your character cannot keep you, you become a disgrace. So your gifts can take you to a place of elevation, of celebration, and people honor you like you are a man of God. You speak and they say that. But your character is what keeps you in the place of authority and blessing. God has favored us. He has graced us, given us what we do not deserve. But he wants us to work on our character so we can stay there. If not, the fall of a great man is worse than the fall of someone who never rose up. Right? If I am on the ground and I fall down, nobody sees me. But once I'm standing here and I fall down, and I pray that I don't fall down on these shoes. But <coughs> it's a big problem. 
So the gray zone is getting smaller because the light of God is shining brighter and he's giving us all that it takes. He has given us all that it takes, but he's manifesting the fact that I've truly given you all that it takes. Go and do what I said. Amen. Holy Spirit, we bless the proclamation of your word. You are the teacher, the wonderful counselor. You are the inspiration behind the word. And you are the wheels that move that word into people's hearts. So right now, I pray that the entrance of your word will bring light. And I pray that the entrance of your word will bring deliverance. And I pray that the entrance of your word will bring revival. We just love on you, Spirit of the living God. We will trust you, Spirit of the living God. You are our great reward. You are our source. You are the umpire, oh God. And when you blow the whistle, we all stop. But right now, you are blowing your wind over your people. And I see the Lord blowing his wind over us. His wind that is driving away chaff from our life. His wind that is driving the chaff away. The wind that is blowing away the smoke and that which is disgusting. His wind is blowing that away. And his wind is at the same time bringing refreshing. Bringing refreshing. To God be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to share what the Holy Spirit downloaded to me while I was in the plane on my way to Cameroon. Uh, I was asking the Lord for a special visitation when I travel because I tell him, God, I left my children. You know, for me, that's big, big, big sacrifice. And when I leave them, I'm expecting big blessings. Because God says that he who... Um, diligently seeks me, shall find me, you know, and he who comes to me must believe that I exist and I am the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So I say, Lord, I'm seeking you. It's because of you that I'm going. If not, I will stay and, and do what I think I need to be doing with these children. Just do what I think because you don't really know what to give your children, right? <laughs> you can be there with them, but you're not doing nothing for them. <laughs> <laughs> you're not changing them. You can be there, but you're not influencing them. But I, I just feel like, you know, my presence is important. And yes, it is. But obeying God is more important. So I said, God, I'm going big sacrifice. I asked for a blessing bigger than the sacrifice that I've made. And I feel like a sacrifice, but I know to you, it's just what I'm supposed to do. So I am asking and I am making a demand that I get a harvest from this trip bigger than what I put on the altar. Try that in your life and you'll see what God does. When you put a sacrifice down, make a demand. Make a demand. Connect your sacrifice with faith. So, while I was in the plane, he did not wait until I got to Cameroon. I had a visitation. We were promoted to first class. And, uh, I, and I always thank the Lord when I'm in first class because I feel like I'm closer to heaven. <laughs> because you just have such a comfort and you feel like it's the Holy Spirit comforting you. But it's really, <laughs> it's just the earthly things comforting you. But it's just, um, you know... You, your body, your mind is at a peaceful place. And I think that there are special things that you get when your mind and your body, your environment is different. Like you get first class, I, I called it first class revelations when you're in first class. <laughs> but um, I, was, I was asleep and I heard the Spirit of God speak to me. Before I went to bed, I said, Father, I want to meet you. I want to know you. I, I want you to reveal yourself to me. I, I think I ha have a little idea of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to meet the Father. Uh, and this is what you said in your word very clearly that, you know, you would show the Father to us plainly. It's a promise. I will show you the Father. He says, from now on, I will not speak to you in parables. I will show you the Father plainly. When I read that, I'm like, so what is happening that I'm only hearing parables? This is what you said. Let me just let me let me find that verse for you so that you know that I'm not making it up. Praise the Lord. It's in John chapter 16, verse 25. 
John chapter 16, verse 25, it says, These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Plain. That is in a language where you don't have to interpret. <laughs> you don't have to feel like, you can understand. And I'm like, God, this is what I want. This is your promise. You said when the spirit comes, he's going to show us all things. This is what he was saying about the spirit. Now, sh tell me about the father plainly. I want to know about the father. Amen. And I slept up with that prayer. And in my dream, I received a visitation. Ready to hear it? Okay. The father said, the spirit, I believe it's a spirit. He said, I'm going to show you the Father through the Old Testament. I'm going to show you the Father by painting what the, the, the acts of the Father through the Old Testament. I remember Pastor always say the nature of the Father is displayed in the Old Testament. So we have the acts of the apostles, the workings of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and and the, on the, he, like the Old Testament. The paintings of the Father. And he said, when I got up, he was like, one more time will I flood the earth. He said, one more time would I flood the earth. This way, I will not say there were audible voices, but it was so clear that I thought someone was in that place. And then he said, one more time have I flooded the earth. So those were in two tenses. Will I flood? Have I flooded? And immediately I said, Father, Spirit, speak more. And he said, open your Bibles with me to what he told me. It's Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter, Chapter 7, we know the story of Noah's ark. So he said, go to the first instance that you heard about the flood in the Bible. And I'm going to make this very quickly um, since we don't have enough time. But I started writing. Once he told me, go to the Old Testament and look at the flood. Brethren, I was writing for two hours nonstop. My husband turned to me and said, he couldn't even stop me. I was writing nonstop. It was heaven was flooded. My mind became flooded. I could not stop thinking about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I, I, I go to the restroom. I'm like, God, I can't stop the revelations. God wants to flood your mind. You know, a flood knocks down everything on its way and all you can see is the evidence of the flood. Says one more time, I want to flood the earth. Elizabeth, I'm going to flood your mind where you get obsessed with me. You get obsessed with my goodness. You get obsessed with my, my mercy. You cannot see anything, no think anything but my goodness. So that you see an evil thing, but in it you see my goodness. You see a tragedy, but you see, oh, look at it. It's goodness. He says, that's what I want to do. Flood my children's minds with my goodness. One time I flooded the earth with judgment. But now I'm flooding with my mercy. The blood of Jesus was God flooding the earth one more time. He was flooding the earth now with restoration. God flooded the earth to destroy every sin. Destroy the flesh. And Jesus Christ came to flood the earth now to restore. Back to man that which was lost. When the Holy Spirit came, there was a flooding with power. So he said, one more time, one more time, flood. I want you to be asking God, flood me. Let, let there be a Holy Ghost flood, a flood of your goodness. Because that's what he, uh, he, he meant for you. So quickly, we're going to look at this chapter. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark and you and your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. 
You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, male and female. Thank God it's male and female, not male and male. Hallelujah. Two of each animal <laughs> that are unclean, a male and a female. And the Lord kept saying that. I don't know. He kept emphasizing male and female, male and female. When he's emphasizing, he knows that man would want to f do it their own way and do male and male, female and female. So he made sure that he kept saying that, male and female, male and female. Praise the Lord. Okay, um, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Uh, why the flood? I'm going to ask some questions and we're going to answer. First question, why the flood? Why did God send the flood? This is what he said. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. five. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. And God was sorry he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. So God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man, man and beast, creeping thing and bird. I'm sorry that I made them. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So there was immediately an interruption of God's judgment. I will destroy man, every man. An interruption comes in, there was a man. Because of this man, things are going to change for the earth. Because of this man. And what, that, what was special about this man? He had found grace. I want to tell you that you are the man that you has found grace before God. You have found grace before God. Because of Jesus, you have found grace. So God was going to destroy all of us, send us to hell. Because you are there, you have found grace. So Noah is representing a prototype of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, because of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is God's ark today. And we're going to see that. So now look at this man Noah. I just want us to see why did God choose Noah. First, it's because he found grace. Secondly, the genealogy of Noah, verse 9. They said, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. If, except if English is wrong, this is the genealogy of Noah. Brother Clement, what do you expect? Names. His history on the earth, where he came from, the father of Noah was this and his grandfather. Genealogy. But look at what they say about this man. His genealogy had nothing to do with where he was coming from in his natural background. It had everything to do with his spiritual background. It had everything to do with his inheritance. His spiritual inheritance. He was a judge man. He walked with God. He was perfect in his generation. That was his genealogy. When God picks a man to use, he's not looking for what the man has been in his natural background. If he has PhD or he has a master's, if he has family or he has wealth, he is looking for his spiritual inheritance. What he is in God. What your spiritual roots, thank you. Your spiritual root. Brethren, we have a great heritage in Christ. You know, we have a name. Our last name. Our family name is a big deal. You did not hear me. Because some people say, when they mention the name of Miss Waddell, it's a big deal in Carroll County. Because her husband and that family name was well known. It's a big deal. Whose name is a big deal somewhere? Can't tell me your name if your name is a big deal anywhere. <laughs> Look, uh, is that your name? No, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just asking anybody whose family's name is a big deal. And you can be proud to say it. It may not be in America. It may be in your village, but it's a big deal. Yours? Yeah, Kenneth. Kennedy. Kennedy. That's a big name. So there are some last names that have influence and power. You go there, mention that I'm the son of, oh, okay. They, they, they change what they were not going to do for you because they don't want to get into trouble. 
they know that you're connected, right? Now I have good news for you. Because you were born into the family of God, your last name has power. Your last name, the name of your daddy, has power. It has buying power. It has transforming power. It has power to bring you favor. It has power to change people's attitude towards you. If you would know that that is your last name, and if you would only carry that name with you wherever you go, it has buying power. We belong to a great family, brethren. We belong to a great family. It's, it's nothing compared to the name of Trump. I mean, it's nothing compared to Obama. It's nothing, nothing compared to those names. It's higher than every other name. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, why was Noah chosen? He found grace. Secondly, he had a history with God. He had an inheritance. He had, he, and he was counting on that inheritance. He was counting on his spiritual inheritance. Stop counting on the works of the flesh. Stop counting on that which your family can give you. Second thing, who were those, we saw the man that God selected, who were those who were to go into the ark with him? The Bible says in verse 8, but I would establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark with who? Okay. Verse 8. Okay, let me read. But I shall establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark. You, your sons, your wife, your son's wife, and your, your son's wives with you. So who was going into the ark? Please talk with me, okay? You know, I just, I just got to be prepared for this message in a short time, so I need help. Okay. Who was going into the ark? His sons. His sons and their wives. So the people that were allowed into the ark, God was going to destroy the whole earth and destroy all flesh. Now, when God floods the earth, he destroys all flesh. That's one thing you have to remember. Flesh cannot stand in his presence. He destroys all flesh. And spiritually, when the love of God is pouring out, when the mercy of God is pouring out, it's to destroy our flesh. You cannot serve him in your flesh. You cannot serve him with your flesh. He comes in his spirit to destroy your flesh. Because Adam had sinned and messed up. God was saying, one more time, let me show these people that I can create a new earth without flesh. His grace, thank you, destroys our flesh. His grace destroys our flesh. So, now, what amazed me was like, I always imagined that the ark was a place that everyone was invited in, but only few people wanted to come. Did anybody have that imagination? Because that's how they taught us in Sunday school. <laughs> they mocked at him. They laughed at him. I didn't see that when I read. I really looked at that part because I really believed that there was a place where they were mocking at him and laughing at him. I didn't see it there. So it's our imaginations. But maybe it happened. What only people that were allowed into that ark, <laughs> hey Jesus, was family, full stop. This ark is for you and your family. So if you're not related to Noah, no place in the ark. Let me tell you, God has created an ark. And if you're not related to Jesus, his son, no place in the ark. No place in his kingdom. No place in his dominion. But he's going to destroy the earth. Those who are allowed into the kingdom of heaven, you must belong. It's family business in here family business. It's on relationship basis. It's not on papers. Whether you have green card or you have yellow card. No. It is on family business. But you know, I want to announce to you, there is an ark that God has made. That is his presence. And you have access because you belong. And God is telling me, many of us sit out there like if this ark is for some special people, for the prophets, for the apostles, for the evangelists. There is an ark which represents the very presence of God. It is for family. Amen. Are you part of the family? Then get in. You have a sitting sign. 
if you're not, you have to become part of the family to get in. You have to. Praise the Lord. Can we just thank God that we are part of his family? Thank you, Jesus, for the family that you have made of me that I have access into the ark. Verse 17 says, And behold, I myself am bringing floods of water on the earth to destroy under the earth all flesh in which there is breath of life, everything that is on the earth. Verse 18, But I will establish my covenant with you. Everybody say, But I will establish my covenant with you. So the purpose of the flood, what is the purpose of the flood? The purpose of the flood, two purposes. First, the flood was to destroy all flesh, everything that was evil, everything that represented the old because God wanted to create a new world. He says, Ad Adam filled me and now everybody has followed him. I in Jesus Christ, Father, the Father, it, it, all this was prophetic of what was going to happen through Jesus Christ. So the Noah's Ark was a prophecy of what was coming. So through Jesus Christ, I am recreating a new world. So he says, come into the Ark. The second purpose is for establishment of covenants. So outside the Ark, I am destroying all flesh. Inside the Ark, I am doing this covenant with me. I covenanted with Noah, but now I wanted covenant with his sons, with his wives, with everyone that is inside the ark. God brings us in, not so that we say that we have escaped hell and we have escaped the tumors of hell. He brings us in for the purpose of intimacy. He brings us in so that we can know that we truly belong. So that everything that you have becomes his. And everything that he has becomes yours. That is covenant. Amen. That's all. That is his main purpose. He could have taken Noah immediately to heaven if he wanted to save Noah. He could have just raptured him. But he took him into the ark to establish covenant. You are in the kingdom of God. For covenant. God is saying, everything, Janice, that you own, I want to have it. And everything that I own, I want you to have it. It is for that exchange that he took them into the ark. Because God was like, can I recreate the Garden of Eden again? I am miss the Garden of Eden. I miss the time I was walking with Adam and fellowshipping with him. I miss the companion. Now let me create an ark. Let the people that come in out of grace come back. To walk with me, to talk with me, to see me face to face. Because if you read that story, it is God himself that shut the door of the ark. It means God was inside with them. I want you every day that you walk with God. Say, God, establish your covenant. Covenant, there are always two parties. I cannot go into it. The, 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 it there are always two parties. There's always an exchange. It's always an exchange. Always an exchange. These days I tell God, you see, I'm having these terrible thoughts. Can I just exchange it with yours? I'm having, you know, I'm having this misery and feeling bad attitudes. And I just, I just want an exchange covenant. Take them away from me. Give me yours. Let me think what you're thinking. This stuff here is not good. I even don't know how to get out of it. Just give me yours. Amen. And God will be like, see my love, see my goodness. And all of a sudden, I've forgotten my misery. And I'm rejoicing in him. Covenant. Fellowship. Daily. Daily. Moment by moment. That's how we become by, like him. Now, what was happening in the flood? I love this part. And, and this is what God did by the spirit of the living God transformed my life. What was happening while um, Noah was in the, in, in, the, in the ark protected? Genesis chapter 7, verse 6. Let's do 16 and 17. 
So those that entered, male and female of all flesh. Hallelujah. Again, I told you, it's everywhere. He mentions it consistently. Went in as the Lord had commanded him, and God, the Lord shut him in. I want you to know that you're shut in in the kingdom of God. There is no going out. <laughs> God has shut the door. He opened the door, and he shut it. If you truly belong, there is no way out. You got to stay there. Except if you do not belong, then maybe you're, you are dreaming that you're inside. <laughs> you are not really inside. Okay, verse 17. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. Father, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would reveal to your children what I saw in this wonderful verse. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark, I was going to make a boat, but I did not. And the ark moved above the surface of the earth. So what happened was that the flood <laughs> was walking in the favor of the ark. The increase of the flood, the increase of the judgment, the increase of the trouble, the increase of the storm was walking in the favor of the ark. The ark could not move if the flood was not there. We want to move in the spirit. We want to go closer to God. And he brings flaws. <laughs> and he brings trouble. And then we don't no longer want to move. <laughs> he revealed to me, he said, Elizabeth, every storm is meant to the purpose to move you higher. It was meant to serve your moving closer to me. It has a purpose. If I allowed it to come your way, if I allowed it to come the way of your children, if I allowed it to come the way of your ministry, it is so that you go higher and walk on the top of it. And when you have succeeded to walk on top of these waters on this level, he says, no, but my daughter has been on this long enough. I want her to move higher. Because I'm going higher, yes, higher. Floods are increasing, increasing. Because we only like the part I'm going higher, yes, higher. I'm going higher each day. But tell me that floods are increasing, increasing. Mm -mm. The flood meant to move the ark. It's the wheels on which the ark are walking. Your problems, your trials, Jennifer. <laughs> They are the wheels upon which your inner man is walking towards God. Walking towards God. So we are to walk on the surface of the waters. They are never to overflow us. They were never to sink us. Why? Because no waters can swallow the ship that lies the master of the oceans and earth and skies. No waters can swallow the ship where lies the master of the ocean and earth and sky. Do you know that Jesus, God himself, shut the door. He was inside with the people. Because he said, I'm coming in to make covenant. So he was in that ark. So everything, because he's the name above every other name, everything is below him. He stands on top of everything. You problems you want to increase, I'm standing on top of you. Amen. Trials want to increase, I'm standing on top of you. I want you to know that's your position on top of it. Yeah. On top of it, on the surface of it, on top of it, on top of it. Whenever you feel overwhelmed, check it. Are you in the ark? Good. Do you know who's in the ark with you? That's usually the problem. You know you're in the ark, but you forgot who shut the door. You forgot who shut the door and who said, I've come to establish covenant with you. The disciples forgot who was in their boat. Jesus was in their boat when the storms came. Jesus was, why do you worry my sleep? I'm here communion with my father. 
don't you know who is it that these oceans respect me? That these stumps respect me? That this. Don't you know? Hallelujah. Oh, I like this. Who is he that is in your boat? The master of earth, skies, and sea. And he's not there just having a good time. He's there to establish covenant with you. He says, let me take your fears. Let me take your worry. Let me take your deep weakness. That weakness that is in you. Let me give you my strength. Let me give you my joy. That's his purpose inside the ark. Hallelujah. Can we celebrate Jesus? Can we celebrate Jesus? Can we celebrate Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now it's time to get out of the ark because it's also time to get out of this message. It's time to get out of the ark. So let's read Genesis chapter 8. You know what impressed me was Jesus, the father was telling me, don't you see that I started in Genesis chapter 6, I was talking about the sinfulness of man and how I was disappointed that I created man. 6 represents the number, like sinfulness, the flesh. 7 is the complete number of of man, you know, that's where you t- we see the redemption story, which is Jesus Christ. The ark represents Jesus Christ coming to save the world one more time and bring his family back to his father. And chapter 8, it's a new world. It always begins new beginnings. They are getting out of the ark. They are getting out of the ark. This time they are getting out to create a new world. Chapter 8. Hallelujah. Um, verse 4. The ark rested on the seventh month, the seventh day of the month, on the mountains of Arat, and the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. So it came to pass at the end of the 40th day that Noah opened the windows of the ark which he had made. Now, let me tell you something about that ark. It, amazingly, if you read very well, Noah made that ark and put the windows at the top. This is where the window of the ark was, right at the top. It wasn't at the side like we know. And I'm like, Lord, why would the windows be at the top? He said, first of all, if not, the waters could get in, right? Anyway, it was made so that water could not get in. But he said, the reason why I put the window at the top is so that Noah can only look up. (laughs) To the outside world, the only way access to the outside world is through the up. We should stop looking at the outside world through the sides. We got to look through the eyes of God. Setting our eyes on God. As I set my eyes on God, what do you see for my children? What do you see for our nation, America? What do you see? Go through the up. Amen? Set your mind on things above. Set your affection on things above. Praise the Lord. So I was just amazed. I was worshiping God. I'm like, this thing is just so beautiful. This ark, if I go to describing the ingredients of the ark, you see that it's the same way that God, all the dimensions, it's the tabernacle that Pastor Robinson was talking about. Amazing. Amazing, this God that we serve. But verse chapter 8, it says, uh, um, verse 8, he says, so he sent out of himself. I want us to read this together. So what had happened is that the rain had come down and the ark had rested on, on top of the mountain. One thing you will notice in the ark was that the animals did not eat themselves up, right? Because they came out the same way they came in. I mean, like, the lions did not eat up the goat. And I wondered that, God, this was after the fall. Everything was chaos already. Man had sinned, and man was no longer having dominion over the animals. He had lost dominion. That's why snakes could bite human beings, because we lost dominion. If not, the snake could not bite a human being. Because we were the masters. What happened in that ark? That everything was in order. That the animals respected Noah, and that the animals respected each other. That the food never ran out. That the water never ran out. Thank you. The presence of God. One more time, the Garden of Eden was in the ark. God had recreated for himself another Garden of Eden. Man was back in authority because 
he was back in covenant with God. Once you get back in covenant with God, creation gets back in order. Once we get back in covenant with God, our circumstances get back in order. The chaos is caused by man and man's disconnection with God. Chaos caused by man's disconnection with God. Virgin, I am looking for alignment with God more than ever before. Because I see I cannot fix my circumstances. I cannot fix things around me. I try as much as I want. It doesn't go. So I said, ah, let me just do that which I was born for. To be in covenant with him. Amen. And it always works. So God was like, you've been in the ark too long. You've been ex covenant has been established. Now it's time to get out. That's when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. He says, wait in Jerusalem until I send the Spirit from on high. And it's time for you to take what you have experienced inside the ark and go and share with another person. And go expand my kingdom because my kingdom is only on increase. It doesn't stay in the ark. It is on increase. So he sends him out. Now, let's see the sending out. This was their send-off party. <laughs> Verse 8. Can we read together? One, two, three, go. Okay. Thank you. Praise the Lord. So, he sent out of who? Okay, yeah, he sent a dog. But I want you to pick what this thing is saying because this is a mystery of God. He sent from himself. The dove, is the dove inside you? And then he took it into himself. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the earth to Coming mysterious. Dove inside me, psh, it comes out and psh, inside. What is this representing? The Holy Ghost. The Spirit of the Living God. The Spirit of the God. John said, The one on whom you see the dove come and rest, that is he who is the Son of Man. The one on whom you see the dove. Jesus, the Father, used the dove at the beginning and he used the dove. He used the dove at the beginning and he used the dove again with his Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's too good. I don't think a human being can put these things together. The dove came out from himself. That it means the dove was inside. The Spirit of God was inside the Father. He sent him out from himself to the world. The same description of the Holy Spirit. I will send you another helper. Sent him from the bosom of the Father. This Noah was acting that out. Giving us pictures of what was still to come. What was the first thing the dove done? The dove was a spy to check out the waters. Why do you go into life without sending out your spy? Why would you go into a circumstance without sending out your spy to check out if the waters have subsided? I have decided in my life I will never go into a circumstance without sending out the spirit of the living God. Let him go and see if the waters are okay for me to walk upon. He is a survey of the circumstance. He'll be like, no, Elizabeth, you got to stay in some more. you got to shut your mouth some more. It's not your time for you to speak. If you speak now, you'll mess things up. Shut your mouth. You are ready, but your town is not ready for you. You are ready, but your people are not ready for you. You are ready, but your circumstance is not ready for you. Shut your mouth. Stay quiet. Send the dove out. Release the spirit of the living God. Let him come back with a report of how the environment is. Let him be your Joshua and Caleb to say those giants, they are nothing to you. Come on, go. Spirit of the living God, 
send him out in your circumstance. And the dove, so he waited another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came back. What did the dove come back now with? The Bible says that the dove came to him in the evening and behold, a fresh blocked olive leaf was in his mouth. Hallelujah. Now the dove doesn't come back alone. The dove comes back with fruitfulness. He comes with fruitfulness. He comes with fruitfulness. The spirit of the living God, when he comes back to you, he comes with fruitfulness. Freshness. Fresh revelations, fresh joy, fresh strength, fresh abilities. Not the ones of the old. Not, no, these were fresh leaves. How could fresh leaves be there when God had destroyed everything? How? Where was that leaf coming from? Brethren, think with me. Was that leaf there before or it was a new one? Thank you. I believe it was a new one because they had destroyed everything. So this was a new. He says, I'm bringing the new. Behold, all things are gone. Now everything has become new. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. He brought in an olive leaf. What does olive represent? The oil. We just heard about the oil. The oil. The power of God. So the Holy Spirit comes with the oil. The power of God. The energy for us to do. Before you go out, I must bring you oil. Before you go out into the world, I must bring you oil. So the olive now came in. Now the third time when he sent out the, the, the bird, it did not come back. So Noah knew. I'm, I'm rounding it up. So Noah knew it was time to go out. He had received oil. Wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Then you shall go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem in Judea until the ends of the earth. What kind of God can put this kind of story together? What kind of God? He is really God. And his word is alive. His word is alive. His word is not a story. It's a living thing. It's the living word. Look at that. I get so amazed. I was so like blown away. I have never heard a message on this Noah's. I, I've never seen it anywhere. And the Holy Spirit just starts teaching me and saying every verse of this thing, even when he says the dove came to him in the evening, it has a meaning. He says, Elizabeth, meditate on every line. It has a whole theological meaning to connect everything that you know till revelations. God's redemption story. He was painting it out. In his first act of destruction, he was painting out his love. Amen. What kind of a God? What kind of a God? A, yes. Say so God is an artist, a powerful artist. So now, the, 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 the interesting thing is that the dove went out hovering, just like in the beginning. The Bible says the Spirit of God was hovering on the earth, right? So the dove went out. <laughs> Hovering. One more time, the Garden of Eden. So what happened? When the, the, when the spirit hovered, what happened? God spoke, right? Now, I'm going to end on this note because by the spirit of the living God, some people would have gotten transformed. There are two things that the spirit of God does when he's hovering. The first one is that he's looking for a resting place. He's looking for a home. Someone on whom he cannot visit but rest. Rest it means dwell. Rest it means I change ownership. I, I become the boss. That's what he means. Say, don't you know that your bodies are the temple of the living God? He says, I want to make you, Robinson, my embassy on the earth. So it doesn't belong to you. I just bought your property. And then I do the renovations. Now, when you buy a home, a home that is not really good. Now, to us, we think our bodies are so beautiful. I think mine is. You think you are so smart. Yes, you are. But to God, mm -mm, not too good. So he has to do renovations if he's going to stay in that home. He has to make it in a way that is comfortable for him. He has to enlarge some rooms, right? Because this room is small. When I went to Cameroon, I always like to stay in like guest houses because some of those guest houses are really nice. They are not like the hotels where they are small, tiny. The guest houses are big, huge. And I'm like, wow, this feels good. This feels like America. And the Holy Spirit is telling me, I do like to feel, I like to be in a house that looks like heaven. 
that has the dimensions of heaven, that has the taste of heaven. So if I'm going to stay in your house, it has to look like heaven. But the good thing about the Holy Spirit is that he doesn't ask you to do the renovations. He just wants to buy the piece of property. He says, I bought you at the price. He said, I just want to buy this land. I will do the renovations. I have my team, renovation team. I, I, because if you do it, you're going to do it in your standards to your taste. But because it's my home, I'm going to do it my style. I can't wait to ha- build a house my style because my style, I have been house shopping and I haven't seen it yet. That's how the Holy Spirit is looking. So he says, I will do renovations. And I will bring, the first thing that he brings, not the first thing, but this is, I'm just going to talk about three things that he brings in his renovation crew. The first thing is that he enlarges the rooms. Amen. Make more space for me. I've come to dwell. He needs more territory, more place that is his control. In your mind, more room for him. Amen. More room for him. Then he comes with some gifts, which I call the appliances in your house. Those are the gifts of the spirit. You can't have a house without appliances. I want to cook. I want to wash my clothes. The gifts of the spirit are the appliances that he fills your house with. To make you well functioning, that house must function. Then he brings his decor. The house is not a home until it's decored. Paintings and beautiful things. Those are the fruits of the spirit. What makes us attractive to the Holy Spirit? The fruits of the spirit. And then he brings food. He brings food. Because if you have a house where you cannot eat, it's not a house. He brings good food. The word of God. Hallelujah. The word of God. The food for your spirit. And then I love this part. He comes with his company. He comes with an escort. And he's supposed a security guard at your door. The angels of God. Ah, the security guard that come with him. I don't know about you, but me, I'm amazed by this Holy Spirit. So he's like, Elizabeth, all I need is to pay cash to have your heart. And I did that through Jesus. But you did not know. You know, there are some houses you buy and they still put sold sell, sale sign on it, right? <laughs> He said, many believers are still walking with the sale sign. <laughs> Meanwhile, they have been bought with a price. And they show the devil like they are still available. They show the world like they are still available. They show themselves like if they are still available. Meanwhile, they have been bought. He cannot start renovations until you pull down the sale sign. Until you put it sold. No more options. Then he comes with his renovation team because the purpose of him doing his renovations is so that he would find a man to whom he would be able to say, after I have hovered around this place, no more will God be the one speaking to create because I have handed, I have found my man. The Bible says when the spirit of God was hovering, God spoke, let there be light. So God did the renovation so that Clement would be the one to speak, let the B and it will be. That was the purpose of the renovations inside you. It's so that when you speak, let the B, God has spoken and creation has to bow. God was recreating the garden of Eden, giving man back control, giving back man power, giving man back authority. But if you look like you looked like before, you will not be able to speak differently. For you to speak differently, you have to look different. So I shift this house, I knock it down. I like this, that TV show, what does it call? HDTV, they do constructions and knock down old houses and... Home improvement. House flipping. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. And he wants your permission to knock down those walls. To knock down those walls. To knock down the small walls of your thinking. To knock down the small walls of your imagination. To blow your mind off. 
and to blow off the roof and build something of his own, something he's comfortable with, something he's proud to say, that is my home and that is my man. When he speaks, creation listens because all of creation is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of man. So, he's looking for a resting place and then he's looking for a house of speakers. He's looking for a resting place. Transforms the place into a place that is his amplifier to give others on the earth so that he can recreate this new earth. He cannot speak again from heaven because he gave back the authority to man. So man has to speak. He is inside speaking to us, but he, we are to speak to the world. You are to speak to that sickness. You are to speak to death. You are to speak to your bitterness. You are to speak other things. He wants to renovate you in the inside. Can we stand up on our feet and pray? I will just ask some people to pray what the Spirit of God was teaching. I received this. I'm still working on it. But I believe that God is showing his redemption purpose. His purpose in Pentecost. His purpose in, 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 you know, in transforming our lives. So, Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. We worship you for your word. What beautiful pictures. What beautiful painting. You decide to do with us, Lord. Oh, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Just begin to talk to the spirit of the living God. I don't know if you're not in the ark, brethren, run in because the flood is coming to knock, knock down everything. And if you enter the ark with flesh, just put it out because it can't get in there. It can get in there. It has, there's no room for flesh. All flesh has to be destroyed. That's why he said, I crucified. My old man was crucified with Christ so that it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. Yes, the old man has only one thing to die. It must die. And God is sending the flood so that, that that old man be completely dead and die daily in our lives. Oh, spirit of the living God, we refuse to serve you with the flesh. We refuse to get into the ark with the flesh, you God. We let your love flood everything that is of ourselves so that this new life that you have for us that you're bringing in with this new olive leaf, this fresh olive leaf, that we will receive it and that freshness will come upon us. Freshness will come upon us, Lord. Father, we thank you. May your name be exalted forever. Yes, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus in the midst of the storm that we will know that you are with us in the name of Jesus and that the storm is not to destroy us but to take us higher, to promote us, to take us closer to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for everyone going through the storm in the name of Jesus. We pray that that one will find rest in the name of Jesus Christ, and be confident that the storm is not for destruction, but for elevation. Lord, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory in the name of Jesus. Help us to put to death all that which is of the flesh in the name of Jesus, so that the Spirit, O oh God our Father, can really inhabit and expand and make it home in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for such revelations. We thank you for such glorious revelations. We thank you for such glorious revelations for what you have begun to do in our lives, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the mystery of the word of God. Thank you because the word of God is so rich, so rich, so powerful, so glorious. We worship you for the word, the word, the word of the Lord is rich. It's so rich, Lord. We give you the praise. We give you
give you the glory. Thank you for what you are revealing to us. Through your daughter, Lord, through your servant, you have unveiled mysteries to us. Oh, that we may understand the mysteries of our God, the goodness of redemption, the goodness of the great God who redeemed us with his own blood and send the Holy Spirit to transform us and to make his abode in us and transform us into instrument of honor and transform us into instrument that will bring down the glory of the Lord that will manifest as the sons of God and we shall release your glory in the earth. Therefore, in the name of Jesus, we pray for a revolution in each one of us that that which is of man we put aside. And you will build your house in us, Lord. And that is because we are your temple. You will build your house. And the temple of the living God will be clean, purified, and fit for the master's use. We pray, Lord, that this will be our future. And that anything in us that hinders you from having your way, from having freedom and have your space, anything that does not look like heaven in us, oh God, it will be, will be cleansed and will be taken away so that we'll become more and more like you. And we'll give you a home where you can be free, a home where you can be at home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.